as we continue to celebrate the greatest event in the history of humanity. The scriptures proclaim repeatedly, just in case the reality of this astonishing truth is too much for us to comprehend, that this Jesus, born into poverty who lived in an obscure village called Nazareth, whose parentage was suspect, who died on a garbage heap on the outskirts of town, one among many criminals, that this Jesus died and rose according to God's preordained plan for our salvation. And God has raised him from the dead, and he now sits at the right hand of the Creator in glory. Easter ushers in the hope and promise of new life. After the cold and dark of winter, the sun now shines brightly on our cold bones, giving them new life. And what was perceived as dead was only asleep. And the greatest testimony to this miracle of faith is that if a barren tree can produce new life, surely we will live for all eternity in his love. Death for once and for all has been conquered. Death, O oh death, where is thy sting? In this Easter message, through the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter and the eleven could release the chains of fear and stand boldly in the synagogue and on the streets of Jerusalem and proclaim this Jesus, who was crucified by the authorities through the power of God, has the last word, for he is the word made flesh, the logos of God. This Jesus, the risen Lord, he is the one that the disciples meet on the road to Emmaus. Let's imagine the conversation between the two friends as they travel to Emmaus. One says to the other, what really happened? We witness his condemnation, his beating, his crucifixion and death. He was cold and very much dead when they placed him in his mother's arms, when they laid him in the tomb that Nicodemus provided. And we felt totally abandoned as we scurried and hid for fear that we would be next. What had his life been all about? Why did we leave everything to follow him? For it to only end on a hill at Calvary? Surely God did not mean for it to end this way. How do we make sense of the senseless, said the other? Were we duped, made fools of? And now some women want us to believe that his body is no longer in the tomb? How are we expected to wrap our minds around all that has happened? And yet, it is at these moments when we are the most vulnerable, the most afraid, the most doubtful that Jesus is revealed. We can only imagine that these two friends who knew Jesus intimately, yet had their faith shaken to the core, knew that life had thrown too many curves their way and, and they were distressed under its weight. For sometimes life can become too much for us to cope with. Why did God allow my child to die before she had a chance to experience life? Why is my body ravaged with cancer? Why have I lost all that I have worked for, my home, my job, my savings, my family? Why has God forsaken me? And yet it is precisely in such moments that Jesus draws near. He will never ever leave us alone. He is our lean to post. He is the best GPS you can have on the journey. The scriptures tell us that Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. How often have we failed to recognize him in the forgiveness of a friend, the hug of a child, a physician's healing touch? How many times in our self-absorption or pity party have we been prevented from recognizing him? And when Jesus asked them, what are you discussing? They become incredulous at the insanity of the question. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place? Where have you been? But Jesus responds, not defensively, but with a question. What things? Jesus never imposes. He knew that it was important that they be allowed to speak to the burning questions lodged in their hearts. We must be free to seek God if we are to ever find the God inside of us. 
He knew that they would never recognize him if they were not able to speak into their truth, to drop the blinders of doubt from their hearts, to trust in the goodness of God, even when it was not easily visible. He invites them to speak from their hearts, and they did. They spoke of their hope that Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel, only to see him die a shameful death. It was only after they could speak their truth did he admonish them and remind them that as faithful sons of the Torah, as his followers, they should understand what the prophets had written and their eyes would be open. They would have understood that he was destined to suffer and die. For as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, one man must suffer and die to save the world. We know that his words and his teachings set their hearts on fire because they invited him to stay with them. Once we have met the Savior, we want to remain in his presence, to have him stay with us. It only took a simple invitation. They didn't have to beg or apologize. They simply had to ask, and he stayed. Jesus always waits for the invitation. And in the breaking of the bread, we are told their eyes were open and they recognized the stranger in their midst was their Lord and Master. That is the power of the Eucharist. In the breaking of what looks like a simple piece of bread, we become aware of who we really are as members of his one body. Those who celebrate this mystery become a new creation. And just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, our eyes are open to our oneness with all of humanity, to pain and suffering, to the cries of the poor, the migrant, the immigrant, women, children, people of color, the sick and elderly, the imprisoned. In the breaking of the bread, our eyes are open and we recognize the risen Christ. But this Christ does not stay. He vanishes from our sight, leaving us with the burning desire in our hearts to be Christ in a world that is crying out for healing. The gospel tells us that they did not continue to Emmaus, but rather got up and returned to Jerusalem. They knew where they needed to be and what they needed to do. They returned to bear witness that in the breaking of the bread, we are one with all of humanity. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. I am my brother and sister. A powerful image of the breaking of the bread for me is seen in a mural of the Last Supper by Samuel Akinya that is painted on the chapel wall at St. Sabina Church in Chicago. Around the table are men, women, and children from every tribe and nation. And in the center, a very faint image of Jesus. I asked the pastor when the mural was being painted, Father Michael Flager, why the image was so faint. And the answer that I received, I believe, is at the heart of this encounter on the road to Emmaus in the breaking of the bread. What I believe is at the heart of our Christian faith as Easter people whose hearts are burning at the recognition of the Savior. I believe it is why the disciples immediately returned to Jerusalem and why we are sent each and every day to bear witness to the power of the risen Christ in our own Jerusalem communities and throughout the world. The answer was simply this. Until everyone is welcomed at the table, Jesus cannot come into the fullness of his glory. We know that as disciples of Christ, it is our baptismal and Eucharistic responsibility to bring Jesus into the fullness of his glory, standing in solidarity with those who are struggling to reclaim their human dignity, working to chip away at the walls of division and hatred, and to bear witness in the breaking of the bread at the banquet table of the Lord, for we know that there is no room for hatred or division. We are all God's children. All are welcomed. Stay with us, Lord, for we have seen you in the breaking of the bread, and our hearts are burning within us 
for you have the words of everlasting life.